Well, the sleigh part at least. The sleigh. <laughs> okay, now for our first planned speaker tonight. Um, tonight we have Damien McLennan along here. Damien has uh, spoken with us quite a few times. Um, you may have seen him around the community, around the slacks, all over the place. Damien's a bit of a consultant CTO, so. Um, and he's also got a, um, a talk coming up soon, Stack Mechanics, um, which you can also, um, I'm sure he'll talk about later today. Anyway, but today, Damien is here to talk to us about everything you need to know about microservices. And slang. And slang. <laughs> Thank you, Damien. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how I can follow that one. That's, this is the hardest thing to follow since OJ's hacked everybody. Um, thanks, Turtle. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Um, so my name's Damien, um, and yeah, I'm going to talk to you about the most important thing you need to know about microservices. I just did this talk in, D in Perth, for D2D Perth, and when it was announced, a lot of people said, can you come and do this in Brisbane? And so that's why I'm here. And then Turtle and I were chatting. We realized I actually have given an iteration of this talk a little while back. So apologies if you've seen it before, but also it probably bears repeating and there's some new stuff in there. Um, while we're in Perth, this was, um, we sat out on the on the wharf at Fremantle and watched all the cargo ships come in. It was for sort of two nights before the, the Perth talk. So I thought a um, ship full of containers, you know, so it felt like a relevant, a relevant thing. So that's what that is. All right, so who am I? Um, I'm a consultant CTO, I'm, I'm freelance. Um, I used to work at Redify before it was Telstra Purple. Um, I've worked at Octopus Deploy. I've done a series of terrible startups, um, hardware and software startups, um, and learned some, some horrible, horrible lessons that I don't wish on anybody. Uh, and for the last few years, I've been freelance. So sort of being a CTO, being a consultant, combining those things, and I tend to work with smaller to medium-sized businesses, so around the 30 to 50 people um, business size, um, providing sort of architecture and strategy and sometimes a bit of dev, um, sort of consulting at that level. Um, and bring freelancers is, is nice with that because I'm cheaper than um, the bigger consultancies. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um, Turtle alluded to, and I'm going to talk about a little bit, um, I have a business that I'm launching called Stack Mechanics, which is a um, software architecture training business. So uh, a few years ago, I, with a couple of colleagues, a lot of people here would know, ran some workshops under this brand Stack Mechanics, and I'm rebooting that um, for reasons that will become apparent. Someone's at the door. <laughs> um, because, you know, a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight, I see people doing wrong um, all of the time. Um, and I'll get more into that. So a little bit of agenda, some background context for this talk. I'm going to talk about the history of microservices because... I'm a big believer in in any tech thing. It's it's important to understand the history of it, why it why it's come to be, what problem it's solving, and I think we sort of missed that a little bit. Also, I'm really old, and I've been around for a long time, and I've seen all of the mistakes repeated. So I'm going to talk about some history. I'm going to talk about where I see it going wrong for people. Um, there's my clickbait. The most important thing. I'll get to that. Um, and there's some examples, and I'll get into some nerdy stuff, and then, you know, you can ask me some questions. I also have some books I'm going to give away if you have a good question. Um, Ashley Davis down here has written a book on bootstrapping microservices with Docker, Kubernetes, and Terraform. I think it's mostly based around, based around Node. Yeah? Yes. Yep. Um, he's got a second edition coming out, personally signed first edition with a coupon for the... You are signing them, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I have some books to give away. So we've got freebies too. Um, and yeah, come at me with questions. And then Sammy's going to go on after me, but you can come out with some questions on any time. Um, cool. So some background. Um, that's right. Um, so like I said, I've been consulting for a long, long time, and I've done a lot of stuff around microservices, even before it was called microservices. Um, years ago, when I worked for Redify, we used to, and this, you know, there's a few people in this room that were involved, we used to get involved in the really just terrible rescue projects. So like walking into a room and everything's on fire and everyone's upset and panicking, whatever. And we'd have to try to fix it. And generally people would say, well, we want some guarantees of what and when. And we're like, we don't even know what's on fire yet. You're asking us the impossible. So we developed a very tactical way of approaching problems that was like, find the biggest bit of fire and replace it and then make it backwards compatible and talk to whatever. And we sort of developed some patterns around 
um, evolving stuff that was on fire into something that was not on fire. And it was fun. I'm a sicko and I love that stuff. Um, but that's what we did. And so a lot of the sort of concepts that ended up becoming microservices, when that sort of term came out, we we're like, that's kind of what we do. Um, so that's some background. I've been doing this for a long time. Now I'm freelance and I see the same mistakes getting repeated again and again and again. And like I said, I like to work with the smaller businesses because I'm, I have a problem with authority. So big companies and me do not get along at all. Um, as anyone that saw me when I worked at TATS would attest to, it wasn't a fun time for anyone. Um, so I like these smaller businesses because I can get some stuff done. But what I see is these same things happen again and again and again. And to the small businesses, it really hurts them. Yeah. And a few years ago, when, when microservices became really popular, you had a lot of people come out and start talking about it and wanting to sort of, you know, build a bit of clout and, you know, try to slay on TikTok. And they talk about this stuff that they hadn't experienced. And, and I remember sitting back um, at a talk where people were talking about, and here's how we do microservices. It's like, you've clearly never shipped that to production. And I got really upset about it because I'm like, people will listen to that advice and take that advice, copy that advice, and create, you know, big failures. And, you know, I was told I was wrong, and I wasn't. Um, and like right, like right now, I'm, 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 you know, picking up the pieces from from these microservices projects from somebody that just saw something on Hacker News or at a talk and wanted to copy it and repeat it. And you know, now there's a small business that just spent two years and a whole bunch of time building a platform that never shipped. Okay, and there's people in Brisbane walking around with Kubernetes and microservices on their resume that have just walked away from a burning building. And we think this is fine. So, with that as some context, um, I want to go back a little bit in time and talk about the history of microservices. So, I got into tech just before the dot-com boom. Who remembers the dot-com boom? A few people here. Cool. Um, this is a sort of late 90s where the internet was becoming a thing and all of a sudden everybody needed a website. And, and it was the first real wave of just terrible venture capital investments. Like... There was a company called balls.com that just sold balls, like soccer balls and tennis balls, and they lent $30 million. And of course, you know, burnt it all and went out of business. Um, there was pets.com, like there was all these like, just ter it was a terrible time. Um, but an interesting time to get into the industry because literally if you could spell HTML, you had a job. Um, a bit like now. And so I got in around then, and sort of in the early 2000s, and this is around the time of like .NET 1.0, SOA became a thing, service-oriented architecture. And it sort of coincided with um, SOAP, so like SOAP web services, for those who've had the misfortune of having to debug SOAP web services, um, WS Desktop. Um, and so, you know, we had this concept of service-oriented architecture. And the idea of service-oriented architecture was a really nice one. It was, we're going to build these services that encapsulate a business process autonomously. And then you can build applications that are just composed of these services. And it was a really good idea. And if you go and read that original writings about SOA, um, there's some really good concepts in there. And so this was the kind of your PowerPoint enterprise architect stream of SOA. And you have these applications and they'd compose their functionality out of services. And it was all cool. Then do I remember what happened? We got into this. So. Everyone got the modeling wrong entirely. Nothing was able to encapsulate a business problem, problem um, a business process properly. This is a tongue twister. And so they all started talking to each other. And they got super chatty all over soap and it was all terrible. And they all shared a database because spinning up a new database was just an impossible thing to do in the enterprise in 2001. And everything was a mess. And we got this. Um, we got this, I thought there was another dumpster fire meme. Um, and it was terrible. And all of a sudden, you know, you'd have like a service here. I remember one that was called like a, a service manager. It was like one service to like start and stop all the other services in exactly the right order because nothing would work if you didn't. Um, and it was all bad. So then the tech industry did what the tech industry does really, really well, which is a big vendor came along and sold a product for it. And that's where ESBs or enterprise service buses came along. Who remembers ESBs? Yeah, 
few fewer people. <clears throat> so BizTalk, great example. Um, there was an Oracle one, IBM had one, Sun had one, it was all the rage. Um, ESBs were these great things that were usually sold on golf courses. So the CIO would go to lunch and play golf with a vendor and you know the vendor would commit to a million dollars worth of software licensing and maintenance per core um, over the course of three years. And again, a cool concept. You'd have all your services and applications kind of hanging around the edge and you had your enterprise service bus in the middle and basically it just took all of the traffic. And in there, you could translate data, you could modify it, and you could put in workflows. So a request would come in here, and the enterprise service bus would figure out what service it needed to go to, get the result, and push it back. And it was all beautiful. Um, and all of the smart stuff um, was in the heads of the people where the smart stuff belongs, which was the enterprise architects and the BAs, who could just write business rules in here. And then all these services, you could just get people to cut code on them, and everything would be wonderful. Anyone remember what happened to that? This! It was terrible because, of course, these became completely brittle because you're doing software development inside a browser tool that wasn't designed for software development. Software development's quite tricky. Requirements are quite tricky. So all of a sudden, you're trying to like refactoring something like some XML in the BizTalk, um, like in IE6 in the browser. Like, it was awful. And so the ESBs became super brittle. And so what happened was they were meant to sort of empower this ability, like agility and um, nimbleness in the enterprise. And of course they didn't because you couldn't touch this. Like this had a three month change control window. Um, so of course everyone just routed around it entirely and you ended up with exactly the same problem you had before, but you know, with a $250,000 per core instance for production and staging um, thing in the middle that you couldn't touch. This is fine. So this is where we got to in the sort of mid to late 2000s, right? So then, has anyone heard of a company called ThoughtWorks? A few people? <laughs> a few people who have worked for ThoughtWorks. So um, there was a company called ThoughtWorks, which was a consultancy. They're global. Um, they really kind of kicked off around... Um, um, they're very big in sort of the London financial industry in the late 2000s. And there's a guy named Jim Weber, who, if anyone's ever seen him talk, he's hilarious. You should get that, take that opportunity if you get it. He started really pushing the idea of just using plain, simple HTTP um, services. And, and the story goes, he was, you know, at three in the morning, sitting in a data center, debugging some biz talk problem, and went, this is terrible. Why do we do this? And so then the next time, the next time, um, a problem came into ThoughtWorks, he went, well, look, let's just build a service that encapsulates this business process, put a simple HTTP API on front of it, and solve that problem in a nice encapsulated way. Sounds pretty familiar, right? And he ended up going to write a book on REST called REST in Practice, um, which is really good if you want to learn about good REST APIs. Um, a lot of like, who's heard of Hypermedia as an en engine of application state? Three people, four people, yeah. So he wrote a book on that, which was brilliant. Um, really smart guy. And yes, sorry. Um, wrote that book. And then around that same sort of time, um, lots of ThoughtWorks projects started to do it. And then the, the word microservices started to sort of pop out of the woodwork. First time I heard that was coming out of SoundCloud. Who's heard of SoundCloud? Yeah, half the room. Um, so SoundCloud was a company that did like audio streaming and it was like DJs and, and independent artists can upload their stuff and people can listen to it. Um, and if you have a viral tweet, you need to have SoundCloud. Oh, three people got that joke. Come on. <laughs> so yeah, so all of a sudden there was like this movement of microservices and a handful of companies jumping on it and there was a conference and they kicked off a name or whatever and everyone wanted to be on it. Now, SoundCloud, the, the guy who kind of pioneered it at SoundCloud was a guy named Phil Calcado, whose name might be familiar to a few Brisbane people, because he was from ThoughtWorks. And he was actually in Brisbane for a little while doing some ThoughtWorks projects. Then he went to Berlin and took a handful of ThoughtWorks people with him, and then went to SoundCloud and took a handful of people there. So basically, like all of these, like Jim Weber's stuff became the ThoughtWorks London way of doing stuff. 
And then Phil took that to SoundCloud and started doing it. And you know, SoundCloud had this, this, this like they were already getting traction. They had this big Rails monolith, and it was like slow in places and it was hard to deploy, and they were having some issues. So they went, let's just take this little bit. And we'll take Jim Weber's idea and we'll build a nice HTTP service on the front of this process and then our front end can hit it and solve that problem. And oh, that worked really well, let's do it again. So to me, you can kind of trace this lineage from like bad SOA or good SOA to bad SOA to BizTalk to Jim Weber and his rest book to ThoughtWorks London um, to SoundCloud. And that's the kind of lineage as I see it from, from of microservices. And I've talked to a lot of these people and it's sort of, my, my impression kind of roughly checks out. Again, this was kind of bef before Twitter was big and we were like fairly isolated in Australia. So you'd get stuff like three months later, but um, that's generally the history of, of, of what people consider to be microservices. Then um, Sam Newman, who uh, also worked at ThoughtWorks, wrote a book about it. That sort of then really popularized it. A lot of people bought that book, probably read the first three chapters and went, cool, I'm a microservices expert, went out and did it. and Built this again, right? <laughs> Lots of services. Like I see whenever I show this slide, you'll go, yes, I've lived this pain. Yeah, love it. Um, my talks are just therapy for a lot of people. <laughs> so we ended up back here. Again, this is fine. This is not a new problem. Uh, where does it go wrong? There's two reasons. One, we get caught up in the tech. We want to do microservices. We want to do Kubernetes. We want to do whatever. Um, we get caught up in the tech. And this is a big problem with any technology that comes out. People write blog posts about it. They're on Hacker News. They're on Twitter. They're thought leadering. They're slaying on TikTok, whatever it is. And we want to be like them. And we want to get that on our resume. And we get caught up in the tech. And we forget about the business, OK? Years ago, I did a talk about people, the companies that build frameworks first, hoping they can just plug in business rules later for success, and it never works. This is the new version. It's just now it involves HTTP, so it's even slower. Um, something I say to people, if you haven't shipped one service, what makes you think you can ship 20 tomorrow, right? Um, the good, successful microservices architectures started with something that worked. Like SoundCloud, they had something, they were already successful, they had customers, they were getting traffic, and they went, oh, we understand the shape of our problem really, really well. That bit's slow, let's fix it, okay? Like, the, like most of the successful microservice architectures that I've seen in the wild and that you hear about, um, and there's some survivor bias here, of course, they're the ones that went, we had this thing and it worked, and we started pulling it apart where it was a bit yucky, okay? Um, most of the successful things that I would call microservices that I've been involved in worked on that process where there was something and it worked, but it, you know, it was like the, you know, like some of the fun ones we've seen around Brisbane are, um, this works, but it's 30 years old and everyone that actually knows how to make it work is about to retire. Help. Um, that was just for you, Shay. <laughs> um, the ones that you never hear of of being successful are, we had a legacy system that's worked really well for 15 years. We ignored it for two years while we came over here and we built a really new one and we started it and we launched and it worked on day one. They're not the ones you hear as success stories because it never, ever, 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 ever happens. Like I said, there are people walking around Brisbane with Kubernetes and microservices on their resume that have left a screaming heap of dumpster fire flaming behind them. Um, it never works, okay? Like we're gonna replace our legacy system over here by ignoring it, literally never works. I'm going to say that again, never works. Uh, although it keeps me super employed, so, um, but bad for the industry. Um, so, the one thing you need to know. You ready for the cliffhanger? You need to understand software modeling. Microservices doesn't make this go away. Software modeling is hard, um, and we tend to ignore it, ignore it because we've got shiny infrastructure to play with. Yeah? Software modeling has always been hard. It's why we have jobs. It's something that you need to invest in as a career. So modeling's hard when you are just writing code in your IDE. Refactoring can be hard if you're just writing code in your IDE if you have got your modeling wrong. You know, like who's sort of started building a thing and then you realize you've completely misunderstood the, 
the whole business process and you've got to refactor it and all your tests break, so you just comment out the asserts, so you didn't know. So I mean, you refactor your tests, like modeling's hard, right, in an ID. Modeling is super hard when every um, call you have to make is across an HTTP network boundary, yeah? So, um, some stuff that I see. The first one, first symptom of bad modeling that I see is the service per infrastructure function. Who has written a database service? <laughs> no, good, excellent. Uh, or you're not admitting it. Um, I've seen some terrible stuff. I have seen a data manager service where they literally had re-implemented a relational database on top of a relational database over HTTP. Um, so why? Um, so that's a bad one, less common. The more common we want is what we call the entity service anti-pattern or the service per aggregate root. Who knows what an entity is? Few, that's okay. Um, so like, you know, your domain object, a domain class. Okay, we've well got a service just around that. It looks a lot like this. You have a customer service and an order service, or you know, you've got a, an entity model. You have a customer in your UML, in Visio, you've got a customer, an order, and a shopping cart, and a catalog, and then we turn that into services. Does anyone here remember enough to, old enough, to, is it remember enough to old? Blah, 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 blah. Is anybody here old enough to remember um, Juvie Laval? No, Shay. Rahul. So once he said every class should be a service and everyone thought you've lost it, um, but he turned out to be ahead of his time. We do this. Like you go to Microsoft's microservices guidance, you will see something like this. And they're not modeling business processes. They're modeling an entity. And it's really bad. And so some of the symptoms of that, if I go back, is um, one, your services are way too chatty. Like everything you want to do has to call out to five different services. But some of the other fun ones, are uh, you have to deploy things in a specific order. Again, this is going back to the bad sower in 2001. Um, you have to deploy everything in the same order. Yeah? Yo. So I've done that too. I lived through that era. Everything was a stored procedure, including the HTML <laughs> templating. <laughs> uh, put it all in one database. Absolutely. So let me let me... Let's park that one, because um, yeah, I mean, to step back, you're talking about yes, all of this could absolutely be in one database, and this is where like SoundCloud was was one code base, uh, one database. Where microservices are great, uh, scaling and fault tolerance and resilience, particularly scaling, but also if you're scaling your engineering team, um, if you're working on one code base, it's super easy to trip over each other. So bigger companies have found you can take a smaller team, have them work on one business unit or one business process, work over there and communicate with the other. So scaling architecture is a really good one. You might have something that's really like CPU intensive, but can go down. Um, like it, it, your SLA isn't as high, but then you've got some other thing that just needs to be fast and always on. So by splitting them up, you can get a lot of resilience and speed and scale of your platform, but also of your dev team. Um, that's probably a whole other talk. So I might park that one there. Um, but yes, in a small system, you absolutely should put it in a database. A well-factored monolithic application is better than bad microservices any day of the week. Um, so some of these symptoms, when I worked at Octopus, we used to get support requests. Um, so something you might know about Octopus Deploy is everyone does a, a, a turn of support. So you, like everybody has to do support rotations, which is by far and away, the best way to get empathy for your customers is actually have to support and justify the decisions you've made. That's a side topic. Um, people would say, Octopus Deploy doesn't support microservices. I'm like, what do you mean? Like we have 100 services, but because there are 100 projects, we have to click them all in exactly the same order and it doesn't like kind of deploy them one by one. Um, we need a way to synchronously deploy all the things. That's called a distributed monolith. It's bad. Um, so like deployment being hard, um, refactoring being impossible. If you come across a microservices architecture, and I've seen this recommended as best practice in this very room, um, where everything's in one Visual Studio project because they share so much common code, okay? You've got stuff that is um, too tightly coupled. Okay, you've got this kind of distributed monolith and it's bad. Who's read this book? A few people. Who's really read it? Who's finished it? 
I love this question because everyone goes, yeah, no, I totally do domain-driven design. Who's finished it? No. Domain-driven design is an excellent, excellent book if you can stay awake. Um, it's amazing. Eric Evans, very smart guy, um, but dry, just, just tough work. Um, this is a great book, and it's about domain modeling. And in a sort of 10-year, I think, retrospective of the book, um, Eric Evans got up and said, if I had my time again, I would put chapter 14 and 15 first because everybody got through the first few chapters. First one's kind of fluffy, it's about talking to people. Ooh, we don't want to do that. Um, the second one's services and repositories. You're like, yeah, we're doing it now. Um, and then like, by the time you get to chapter 14 and 15, he starts getting into the really good stuff, which is something called bounded context. And nobody gets that far, because it's really boring. Um, but that's where the good stuff lies. Sorry, just a point. Uh, there's, there's a uh, real good summary in the book called yeah. Baby Dave Copley. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. There are a couple of people that have like had goes at editing Eric Evans' work and done really, really well um, because it's a, it's, it's a really good concept, um, but just dry. It's just hard work. Um, and it's funny because people go, I do DDD, we do event sourcing. You like find that in that book. It's like they don't know because they didn't finish it. So Bounded Context is a concept in this book which is about so to back up, the book is largely around not repositories and services. It's about talking to people and working in the language of the business. So if you've got a complex problem, you sit down with, with expert on a regular basis, like sit them in the dev team, which is, have anyone heard of XP, extreme programming? It's basically that. You sit a business expert next to you the whole time and they become part of your development team. And by talking to them all the time, you understand the language of the business, you understand the concept, and it's reflected in the code. They, they bring what they call the ubiquitous language which is, you know, if a class is called something in the code base, that should be what the business experts talk about, right? Um, the reason I'm rushing is because Sammy's going to go later and I could go all night on this. I could go all week. Um, <laughs> it's okay. So, bound of context. So, yeah, he, it's, it's about talking to people. And, and so, that, like, the talking to people and developing the ubiquitous language is, like, chapter one and two. By the time you get to, like, 14 or 15, I can't remember which, He's talking about when you start to talk to different experts around your business, you'll find that they start to talk about stuff differently. Like what, like who's, who's done this where you think you've got a concept in your, in your company, in your domain, and then you talk to somebody in like the warehouse and what they call a thing is completely different to what the marketing department call a thing. Yeah, there's a couple of nods up there. You've lived this. That's a bound of context. Yeah. Um, it's like if you're booking a holiday, your idea of a holiday might be a, you know, a sandy beach and a cocktail and no, we're not going. Um, and, you know, like white sand, whatever. But to your manager, it's, it's, you know, are you trying to leave when there's a big project delivery on? To your HR department, it might be, do you have that many hours in leave? We need to approve that, blah, 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 blah. So it's like we're still talking about the holiday, but everybody's got different words and a different framing of that. And that's called a bounded context. And if you look at that, it's about like the people and the interaction. So as you sort of have these discussions, you know, well, different people think about this differently. They want different information on that. And it's very, very different. Has anyone worked in a big company where you've had a team of enterprise architects try to build the universal data model? Two of you, three, four. Has anyone seen that work? It doesn't, right? Because people talk about stuff differently. And... You, like the world is not this nice, pretty, orderly little thing. It's different people talk about different stuff in different ways and they have different meanings to it. And all of those things are bound in context. So there you go. I just saved you reading chapter 15 of DDD, but you should do it anyway. It's about when people talk about stuff differently, that's a bound of context. So, gone too fast. I've got ahead of my brain's got ahead of me. Um, so that's what bounded context is about. So it's a really interesting um, modeling tool. And if we look at the way most microservices are built, they completely miss this modeling. So in modeling, you look at the people and the interactions and sort of understand how that works. So I want to talk through um, some examples. I'm going to jump through this a little bit. So like imagine a bad restaurant that was built the way we built microservices. 
you would walk in and you'd go, what's on the menu? And the waiter would go, hang on, I just have to go check. They go, what's on the menu? And they come back and go, there's a burger. And what else? Ah, oh, there's some pizza. Go, cool, how much? The, hang on, pricing service, you know, uh, that'll be fourteen ninety five. Okay, can I order one? Hang on, I'll just check if we have them. Like, this is a very synchronous kind of chain of events, right? And it would be a terrible restaurant because you would need like a waiter for every table because they would all just be lining in the kitchen going, is the food ready yet? Is the food ready yet? Is the food ready yet? Like, it would be a terrible experience um, because everything would be like making a request and then waiting for the response and then polling. Um, it would be bad. It would be inefficient. Everyone would quit. The restaurant would go out of business. Bad Yelp reviews, one star. Um, but that's kind of how we build these services, right? Like, it's terrible. So like a better experience would be you walk in and you sit down and somebody's already prepared the menu so they give it to you and they go, by the way, here are the specials. Oh, and also we just sold out of the fish because the kitchen just told me that, I, that we sold out of the fish. And you look at it and go, we want this and they can go and they ordered it. And you know, like they might put a, a ticket for the kitchen on one slip of paper and a ticket for the bar on another slip of paper. And then, you know, when those things are ready, someone's gonna ring a bell and they're gonna bring you the food or the drinks. And that's gonna run really, really smoothly, right? Because it's not, this synchronous thing, because chains of requests don't scale very well. They just don't. Like who's worked in a business where you want to get anything done, you have to ask your manager and they have to ask their manager and they have to go across and, and then you go down and then like no one can ever get anything done because you need to like, everybody is involved in this decision because nobody has the information to actually do their job. Has anyone worked in that company? <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, that just doesn't work at all. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Yeah. This, my talk's art therapy always, right? So chains of requests just don't scale um, because people that have the information to do their job are better at it and also happier and more efficient, more effective, right? So like in my, in my um, restaurant example, um, you know, the wait staff have a menu. They got given a copy of that menu. Here's the menu for today. Here are the specials. You know, then they're not having to wait in the kitchen seeing if it's done yet. They go and deliver the order and then someone rings a bell. Like the, this order is done and they can bring it out. Um, and on that order, they're not sitting there going, like you don't have a waiter there going and they want a burger that needs some bread on it and some meat and this and some chips. Like the kitchen knows how to make a burger. Yeah, so people that have the information to do their job are more effective. And software boundaries that follow these principles will work better, which doesn't seem like a super controversial thing to do, but we tend to build these things where it's like the cart service needs the order service, which needs the pricing service, which needs the catalog service. We're like, who's seen those microservices? Yeah, didn't work, right? <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Um, so yeah, software that, that, that follow these same principles work really, really well. And it's, you know, largely around the difference between synchronous stuff and, and asynchronous stuff. So in my, in my restaurant example, um, you know, somebody had a copy of the menu. You could even call it a cache. Um, but when the rest of the kitchen ran out of fish, they said, hey, everyone, we're out of fish. That's an event. That's an asynchronous event, right? Um, and people, people hear that on their own time, and then they can kind of deliver that information because they've got, they've got that ability to do that job. You know, the slip was given to the kitchen or to the bar saying, here's this order. Um, which is a command, like table 13 wants these drinks. Uh, and when those, when those things are done, ding a bell, that's an event, the drinks are ready, or some drinks are ready, waiter can come along, pick that up and deliver it. So it's about like these kind of businesses that work well, work well, um, largely are asynchronous type events. Um, and services knowing enough to do their job, which goes back to SOA, which is a business, like a service that encapsulates a whole business process rather than encapsulating like literally like one repository pattern on one database table hidden behind an HTTP service, which is like what we've seen as a result of this kind of rush to, to do microservice. So this service that know enough to do their job work better. And, and this is an old concept. So I developed a fun name for this, which is called human-shaped microservices. Um, and I've been kind of talking about this one for a little while. Um, I should trademark it because I like it. Um, so in modeling, you kind of look for, well, like if it's a real business, you go, well, like who's doing this thing? How are they doing it? What are they doing? 
rather than what database table they're updating, because that's pretty uninteresting for most of the time. Um, or sometimes, you, if you don't have the real example there, you go, well, if we were going to do this with people, how would we do it? And it becomes a really interesting modeling exercise. So I've got two real world examples um, that I'm going to share real quickly of, of where I've used this sort of technique in, in, in real world stuff. So the first one was a, a medical diagnostics platform that had to take some medical data over an API um, and had to process it and analyze it, yeah, and, and look for medical things. I'm being slightly quiet about what. Um, and then send a report to somebody to say, yes, you have terrible disease or not. Um, but also in this system, we needed to allow some research scientists to analyze the data, but anonymously. Again, we're building like healthcare app here. So um, you don't want somebody just poking around in the data and being able to get your phone number and, you know, we're not optus here. Um, <laughs> too soon. <laughs> like, you know, like if you're submitting health data to somebody, you would hope that they've got systems and privacy and security controls in place to make sure that, you know, somebody can't just like select star from diseases where, you know, name equals Damien and go, <laughs> um, so like anonymous, um, and also some operational people to make sure that everything's working okay. So that the stuff's getting processed and things are happening. So like fairly, like it was a fairly a, a serious thing that, you know, had all those sorts of compliance and security and privacy controls and it needed like federal sign off to do stuff. And it was a big deal. Um, and so stepping back on that with a lens of how do people do it, um, I thought about like a pathology lab. Now I've never worked in a pathology lab. To be honest, I'm taking some amount of creative license with this. Um, but if I did own a pathology lab, it would look something like this. The doctor would give you a referral and say, go to pathology lab to get this blood test. Um, and they're gonna put that in a letter. And you go to the lab and you kind of check it in. You go, look, I want this. And they're going to give you some identifier, like some case number, right? Um, and in their system, that's going to be linked back to your doctor. So far, so good? Yep. And then they're going to put your job in a queue. Ooh, queue. That's a thing. Um, and, you know, I'm presuming a nurse, somebody trained to extract fluids from your body. Um, when you're ready, they're going to call you in and they're going to take some blood and then kind of put those samples in a queue. And a lab clinician is going to run the tests that were ordered. Um, and let people know when that test's done. Now, you would hope as a visitor to this pathology lab that the lab clinician, when they're looking at your blood, doesn't know who you are. I would hope. Yes? Is this a concern for people? Yes? Um, that like you want as few people in that facility to know who you are and be able to link your blood and the results that come from it with your identity, right? Again, we're not Optus. There's no one from Optus here, right? <laughs> Sorry, Twitch. <laughs> story about Optus too, but that's another story. Um, so yeah, we want the lab clinician to run the test and say, hey, this job's done, and somebody's going to be looking for that and go, okay, this job's done, and they're going to take the results and they're going to put them in the system and um, send the results back to your doctor, probably by fax, let's be honest here. Who's worked in healthcare? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> um, and also, you're going to have somebody, I imagine, that the lab manager kind of overseeing operations in that lab. Like, do we have stuff on the floor or does everything that got checked in that day actually got done and sent out? You know, some quality control, some stats um, to make sure that, you know, things are going well. But again, you don't want that person to know who. You don't want that person to know what you were being tested for or what the result was. Um, you want people, you know, to, to have as little information as possible. So I didn't do diagrams for this, but what we ended up with was a similar, was a system look really quite similar. Um, you know, data got uploaded and was assigned an ID. There was a reporting service whose job it was, was to get a report to, to people or to like government reporting facilities. Um, and so when the thing got uploaded, you know, the identity got sent there and kind of locked away. The raw data, again, locked away. Um, the, the system that um, actually processed and analyzed the data, it got a copy of the data that was anonymized and it could process it and it could say, hey, this sample here, we detected a positive thing for X. Um, 
and let people know. And the, the service then had to like communicate it back, went, oh, that got a positive result, cool, format the thing went out. Um, and then, you know, you had like research scientists, like I said, in there in, the, in this company, they needed to be able to pull down kind of random samplings of data and look at it and go, did the result that came out match the raw data? Like, uh, is our algorithm right? Um, and be able to run some, some tests on that and some quality control. But you don't want those people to know the names of, of stuff. Um, so we ended up with something that looked a lot like this. Like we had some data and it got processed and the raw stuff was just locked away and what was left was just the medical data. So somebody needed to analyze the, the raw sample, they got that anonymized raw sample. Um, and we had like an operations person role dashboard that basically went of all the samples that have come in, have they been processed? Is stuff erroring out? If it's erroring out, why is it erroring out? Oh, the IOS client team rolled their own HTTP and date library in it, um, uploaded invalid dates, so we need to go and fix that and reprocess the data and kick some stuff off. So we ended up with a system that looked a lot like people would do it in a lab. And what that let us do was build something that was very resilient, because you know, if stuff got, um, if stuff went wrong, we could rerun it. Um, the uh, the processing of stuff, which took some time, didn't stop the uploading of stuff, which didn't stop the emailing of stuff, because everything owned the business process, but looked a lot like it would have done if you had a person doing that job. Um, and the system, like, was a success. Worked really, really well. Has scaled really well. Had very little downtime. We can deploy stuff in whatever order we feel like, um, and it's worked quite well. And and a lot of it was around well, what pe what would people doing that job? What information would they have? What would they need? And it turns out when you start looking looking at stuff like that, most people don't need most of the information. Like REA, like Real Estate Group, they're sort of well known for microservices and it's all. JSON, HTTP, something like 60% of their CPU in their, in their infrastructure, um, you would know this, is dedicated to parsing and serializing and deserializing JSON. 60% of a CPU for a, how many people work at REA? Hundreds of engineers. Um, and because everything is these giant JSON payloads that get thrown out. Who's heard of PACT, contract testing tool? Yeah, a couple of people awesome tool, but they need that because everything is throwing these giant JSON payloads around because everything needs to know about everything else. In this kind of human-shaped world, most people don't need to know that. You just need to know, hey, here's a sample. It needs to be tested for this. And when they come back, go, that sample ID, one, two, three, four, it was positive for that. Um, the thing that needs to send out the results just needs a destination identifier and a result. They don't need all of it, you know, like one big shared database. Everything would just have the information that it needs. Another fun little example was a, um, a distributed ad serving platform. So kind of like a small Google AdWords with no budget. Um, and it needed to be efficiently kind of distributed around the world. And any ad needed to be seen the exact number of times that it was paid to be, paid to be shown, right? Um, but I wanted to avoid kind of distributed database locks all over the world. And cheap. <laughs> Didn't have Google's budget. Um, Google have, what do they call it? Like, not, not big table, but something like that. Uh, Spanner, right? Didn't have that sort of budget. Um, and it was before that time. So like, I really struggled with like a nice architecture for this system when I built it. And ended up thinking about, well, it's kind of like if I had a business that was delivering leaflets. And I started to model it and I went, how would that work? And I went, well, you'd have like a customer who would create the ad and do the artwork and approve it and go, cool, I want that ad and I want it in these areas. And then you'd have somebody that worked in the distribution center and they'd kind of get those orders in and go, okay, this ad needs to go to that street and that street and that street and this ad needs to go to this street and this street, whatever. And then you'd have delivery workers would come in, sign on and go, hey, give me a bundle of flyers to hand out, right? Um, and the distribution manager would go, okay, you're in that street, you need this parcel of leaflets with like this many of each one. And the workers would go out on the shift and deliver the leaflets and hopefully bring back the ones they didn't deliver rather than just bin them, you know, taking some creative license here. Um, and at the end of the day, you could count up and go, this is what got delivered. And so I thought this was a really interesting concept and I ended up with something quite similar where like each sort of web server became a node and the node would say, hey, look, I'm this node, and the sort of distribution manager 
service would go, okay, well, your next batch, you need to show this ad and this ad and this ad and this ad. And it would give them a lease. Like, I'll give you 100 of them on lease and you can come back when you're done. Um, or if you don't finish them, then let us know at the end of your lease period, report back and go, well, I got rid of 50, I've got 50 left and they can go back in the pool. And it worked out to be this really nice, efficient way to do a distributed ad serving engine because this is basically how it would work with people. The people would walk in, get given their bundle, and they'd go out and they'd come back and go, oh, I, I finished my shift for the day and I've got these three left, right? Um, and it was a really interesting way of modeling it. And I, like, I really struggled with the way to model this architecture until I went, well, how would people do it? And then it just became like crystal clear. Cool. I'm going to quickly talk on transports because it's getting late. <laughs> um, so you might have noticed I've said a few words. Cues, messages, events. I like messaging. No secrets here. Um, messaging works really, really well. REST works great for the public internet. Like the public internet was built around HTTP. HTTP was built for the web. There's a whole bunch of infrastructure like CDNs and caching and authentications, all this stuff around like REST as a great public facing API service. But for these internal things where it's like this system over here did something, sold something, an event happened, publish that out. Or like with pub sub, go look, hey, this thing, this thing happened. And anything that's interested in that event can subscribe to it. So messaging works really, 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 really well in microservices. And my main criticism of the microservices book is messaging gets one paragraph. And it's literally messaging. Some people use messaging. I worked on a messaging project once and it wasn't good, don't do messaging. So everyone went, cool, HTTP all the way around. This guy's an expert. Um, it really frustrates me because it's a great way to do it. So a pattern that I've had a lot of success with, and, and I said this once as a joke and everybody laughed, and so I'm just running with it now. Um, mullet microservices. Rest on the front, messaging in the back. <laughs> um, this pattern works really, really well. Yeah. Does it count if it's a webhook? If it's a webhook? Um, so webhook is a great way of doing um, distributed messaging to someone else. Like if you've got, like webhook's cool. Um, and like you definitely can build event-driven systems on HTTP. Definitely can. Nobody does. You definitely can. Webhooks are a great tool to have in your arsenal if you need to communicate with a third party. You don't want a third party um, anywhere near your message broker. You just don't, like it's bad, bad juju, don't do that. Um, webhooks are awesome for that. Um, but what I would do is, because the, the thing with, with webhooks is, I mean, you can, have, you can have multiple subscriptions. With message brokers, pub subs built in. So you can have a service and you can have like a whole bunch of services. And there's a whole other rant I can tangent, I can go on around evolutionary architecture and pub sub. But if you have an HTTP service and you tell three other services when something happened over HTTP and then a fourth one comes online, you need to change your code to tell the fourth one, yeah? Whereas with PubSub, you can publish an event. The drinks are ready. And anybody that cares about the drinks being ready um, or the order being sent or the tra credit card transaction being declined or whatever that event was, any service that cares about that can subscribe to that event. And so services can spin up completely or autonomously without telling the publisher that, that, that you need to include me, right? So PubSub works really well. Webhooks is a good way of doing that outside of your network boundary, but it's a lot of extra work to do it internally. Like, because you have to build like a million webhook subscription platforms and just sounds like a lot of work. Um, so this pattern with a load balancer on the front, these small like autonomous business process managing human shaped microservices here, each with their own database, please. Um, and route them at the load balancer, like slash customers goes to customers and slash whatever goes to here. And then when these things process something, they publish an event and the other ones can pick it up. So like the medical diagnostics platform worked like this, you know, we'd get an upload and then a message go, look, there's a new upload. So like the, the thing that did the processing diagnostics needed to care about the upload, um, the operational service that needed to track if everything was getting processed or erroring out, it cared about that so everyone could get their own copy, their own little slip of paper with whatever data they needed on there by subscribing to the events. And it lets you like evolve your architecture horizontally by just saying, here's the new service, it's gonna own this process, it cares about this bit of data and this information and this event and this event. And nothing else needs to change. Like who's heard of the open close principle in solid? Who's heard of the solid principles? 
few more people. Open close principle, which says like, if you want to extend something, like you should be able to extend it without performing open heart surgery on it. So like pub sub is a kind of great way to do that at an architectural level. You can say, hey, I care about that too. Plug me in, right? Um, message broker here and then these services. So I call it that. Everyone laughs. I'm running with it. I own that now. Um, trademarking that one. I used to have a mullet. It was bad. <sighs> I was 15 and in a metal band, okay? It was, <laughs> there are photos. Some conclusions. Learn from history, right? Every, every tech thing that comes up um, is probably was done and abandoned 10 years ago and for good reasons. Um, learn from history. Like I look at technology now and I go, that won't work. People go, no, Microsoft said it'll work. It'll be awesome. Like it's not going to work. It didn't work five years ago. It didn't work 10 years ago. It didn't work 20 years ago. Blazor is not going to work. Um, <laughs> you wait. When Microsoft wraps it up in 18 months, they go, oh, look, it was right. Um, learn from history because, like, if you pick a problem, like, pick a technology or a stack or a piece of infrastructure or a trend or whatever it is and don't understand what problem it's solving and what caused that problem, like, because we, we're like, like, Pact is a great tool, but it solves the problem of people relying too much on giant pay JSON payloads. So, like, let's not solve that problem. Let's go back a few more and solve the best one. So, like, these... Like we, we tend to solve the wrong problems all of the time. And if you were kind of to, to look back and understand the history of, of why we're here, some of this stuff is, is really apparent. Um, microservice and SOA have the same roots. No matter what Martin Fowler will tell you, the, the core guiding tenant, which is like, let's wrap a business process in a thing that can be accessed across the network. They're basically the same thing. Um, and if you're modeling something, look at people and business processes. Don't, don't start with a, a database schema and then turn that into HTTP. Um, it's it's you know, bound to go badly for you. Um, and never forget that our goal is to deliver value. Like nobody, I mean, no, there are people walking around that have better paying jobs just because they put microservices on their resume. Bad for the long-term sustainability of the industry. Your job as a software developer, a software engineer, or anyone as a member of a sort of like a product team is about delivering value for your customers, for your boss, whatever it is. Um, like the customers don't care that you're on, oh, we moved to this. Like Uber engineering blog is just like hours of comedy for me. It's like, MySQL sucks, we moved to Postgres. And then two years later, it's like, Postgres sucks, we moved back to MySQL. And then the Postgres guys go, that thing that you just ported to go, we can do in one query and it takes a third of the time and none of the people. Um, they don't care, they're just burning VC cash. So yes, I would be remiss to mention um, that I'm running a course in building modern microservices in .NET, which is a lot around like the modeling, like modeling processes and stuff like that. Um, but also how to actually get started, like how to spin up the stack. Um, some of the tips and tricks I've learned for like building a, a, like an agile engineering type approach to building services, the sort of tools and libraries that I can plug into sort of that I've learned, you know, in my time rescuing stuff but like to efficiently spin up, build, model, operate a service, monitor it, instrument it, understand what's going on. So like it's a lot of my experience crammed into a three day um, workshop, um, which is kind of like what I've seen, how to avoid some of those traps. So that is in November. Um, I'm doing another one in Perth in November. If you would like to come, bne.net gives you $200 off the course, valid till the end of next Friday. Um, it should be heaps of fun. So um, if anyone is interested in that, come and talk to me. If you want me to write your boss a letter, I will. Um, and I have to shout out to Rahul, who's kind of inspired me to hustle a bit more. Does anyone see Rahul's talk here last month? Amazing. Um, I'm like, right, that's it, hustle. Um, <laughs> I've been writing so many blog posts. Um, so yes, building modern, modern microservices.net, that's my plug for the night. That is a course that I'm teaching. Um, if this gets off the ground, I'm gonna have a lot more courses that I wanna do, some that are more language agnostic, some other stuff around DevOps, some stuff around operations, some just pure modeling stuff, some test-driven development stuff. I have this backlog of courses. So um, basically, I can help the industry better if I'm teaching people rather than like throwing water on people's fires. That's my plug. With that, I have time for three good questions to win a personally signed copy of Ashley's book. Anyone got any questions? Taunts, trolls. 
Chili. You you, I'm going to absolutely slay. I just need TikTok. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, this this is what databases is a yeah yeah so spinning up another database is not a extreme amount but it was twenty years ago right yeah. and a lot of people in those kind of executive decision making places um, stopped being technical twenty years ago um, and yeah it's I don't have a secret to this. this is kind of why I freelance consult because I can sit in front of a CEO and go here it is in a way that you'll understand and. Uh, and kind of get there. I mean, it's it's um, databases are cheaper. The other problem with databases is they used to have at least come with, with very expensive DBAs. Um, that's a lot more, particularly like if you're in something like AWS. A lot of that stuff you can just automate a lot of that stuff. But like that old school way of thinking is the database is expensive, the RAM is expensive, the storage is expensive. Whereas now they're kind of throwaway things. Also our tooling has gotten a lot better. So like automating migrations, um, automating backups, all of that kind of stuff. Like that used to be a person's job was to sit there and hit go on the, like like the DBAs with these like massive, terrible hand rolled um, backup and restore scripts that you just hoped work because you saw these guys out of hours and you went, yeah, we're trusting you on what? Um, <clears throat> so in general, like one of the big problems, like databases used to be horrible. Like companies used to spend you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on database CPU time, right? Um, and in general, you can get away with much cheaper database instances because one of the things databases were never good at was scaling horizontally. You could scale them up. You could buy more CPUs, more RAM, but it was very hard to kind of scale out the way we did web servers with uh, a more service-based approach. You can have lots of smaller databases and maybe only one of them is actually under load. Like it used to be you'd have this database um, and like one component of your system was under massive load while the rest of it was snoozing. But the rest of that application was kind of like hung and offline and terrible because of this one fast bit. So you can scale it uh, more along a business line by saying, look, this bit's the slow bit. And also because you're not dealing with like the one grand unified database schema to rule them all, you go, this bit that's under load, we could put that in like some document database or some key value store. Like we can experiment with different data modeling techniques and therefore different storage engines with, you know, different attributes because not everything is one giant like acid transaction 15 table join. We can say, let's take the bit that's slowing down the 15 table join, publish that out and stick it in. I don't know. I don't want to say Mongo, but Mongo. Um, <laughs> don't use Mongo. Um, <laughs> story about longer. Anyway, um, so yeah, you can kind of, by looking at different ways of modeling it, you can look at different SLAs and, and, and cost. You can go, look, that bit is costing us a lot. We can shape it like this, put it over here, feed it with an event stream, and it will cost us a lot less than what the whole application is costing us to run on, you know, a 15 core, what's the giantest AWS database? Come on. Like a 24 XL. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's also maintenance costs yeah. in having multiple teams put on a coordinated scheme of migration yeah. on one shared database. Yeah. Com um, companies that had like the entity framework, EF migrations hat that only one person could run. Yeah. You get a book for that. That's a great question. Come and see Ash, you'll sign it. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I ask? I'm speaking from you don't get a book. You've got books. I don't, I don't get <laughs> um, speaking from a, like an OSQL perspective, yep. I mean, it's easy to spin up one server mm. on a ten dollar a month mm. thing and run you know a dozen databases on it. Mm. So it's, it's really easy from a from, you know dev environment cost, yeah. And then scale that machine up and you know as the as it starts to match. Mm. Uh, can you do that with SQL these days? Can you have like one database yeah. server? Yeah with lots of databases. Yeah you always could. Yeah it's just like like the, the free version of SQL um, like SQL Express, you just kind of have like lots of RAM. Um, but yeah, like small cheap stuff, it's it's easy. Yeah. Oh, now the questions come. You yeah. Cool. This was therapy for you, wasn't it? Yeah, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we go back a couple of years and we look at how microservices have been sold. Yep. Um, you described the model of what a lot of people have been doing is throwing like some repo. Um, yep. Front of a, data, a database yep. with a single API, yep. and that was pretty much it. Yep. Um, that was done 
in line with what a lot of people would argue was the single responsibility rule from, from top. Like, yeah, this, this and that's terrible modeling because you've got like low coupling, high co no, the other way around. High coupling, low cohesion, yeah. So, but you got what a lot of people argue is. This, yes, this and where are they now? Yeah, sure. They've all left. Like, yes, a lot of people argued that it was the right thing, and this is kind of what prompted me to write that talk, was literally a guy standing here went, this is the way to do it. I'm like, this is dangerous. Like, they were wrong. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. It's like, oh, how's micro should a service be? Five lines of Python. That's it. <laughs> so, my question is, yep. what is, or how do we apply the single responsibility principle to the model that you're advocating for? Yep. Because a waiter, for example, has more than one job. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll give the brief answer. Um, I don't think you should apply like, like a single responsibility should be like, what is that person's job? Not like like single, like it's like you don't apply that class level solid principle at an architectural level. You apply it at a bounded context level. There are exceptions, like some things just like, look, this works, this little bit here, like PDF generation, perfect, let's get it out of there. Um, to the point where you have a cluster of yeah, projects. Yeah, like, so, so don't, don't do single responsibility at an architecture level because then like rather than just calling a method, you're calling an HTTP and, you know, it's bad. So don't do it. Yeah, you get a book for that. And there was one more, and then I'm going to get off. <laughs> we don't have another four hours. Q topology, I can go on about hours. Um, sorry, ask again, and I'll try to give something generic, but the answer is going to be it depends. You still get a book. <laughs> Like, do you want to? Oh, I see. Gotcha. Like, as in, like, a piece of infrastructure or one actual queue? Piece of infrastructure? Um, depends on the size of your business. Most people in Brisbane can get away with one piece of infrastructure. ActiveMQ can do bazillions. Um, in terms of, sorry? Yeah, sorry. It was, it was should you have, like, one... Well, there's two ways of looking at it. Should you have like one message broker um, versus lots of message brokers? Or should you have, or well, the other way you can take it is should you just have like one queue um, that everyone feeds off? So Kafka kind of tends to follow the one queue. It depends on, so actually, little, little, little. generally most people aren't big enough to have multiple things. Like if you need to communicate within your organization with other services, putting it on one piece of infrastructure, unless your company is is structured like multiple companies where like it is like a Zapier webhook or something like that, that like you're completely separated across network bounds or whatever. Um, I would do one generally for most, most things that you're going to see in your lifetime, one piece of messaging infrastructure. In terms of queue topology, it depends on the piece of infrastructure. Different one of them work in different ways. Generally, the way I like to do it is like a pub sub thing will be a topic. Like there's, again, different words based on the infrastructure, but like a topic and subscribers. Um, and then commands will be a single queue because you want a single consumer of a command. So if you issue a command, you only want it to be done once. So it can be on one queue. I tend to do it like one queue per message, unless it's pub sub, and then it's a topic per message, and then one queue for each subscriber. But again, that's way in the weeds. You still get a book. And I'm going to shut up because Sammy needs to do her talk. Thank you. <laughs>